I don't know. I, I, I will say, I don't know if, if my diet is going to make somebody live longer. I don't know if it's going to either prevent or increase the likelihood of some disease because we just don't have the data that shows that now. Hi everyone, it's Daryl here from Plant Based News and today we've got an interesting video for you. A video was recently uploaded to Lauren Knight Hughes' YouTube channel and it's a debate between plant based doctor, Dr. Garth Davis, and the carnivore advocate, Dr. Sean Baker. Is meat the reason that we have a lower life expectancy than other countries because we eat more meat? No, it's it's much more complicated than that. There's so many different things that go into a diet. Do I think meat is a healthy part of a diet? No, I don't. But you have to break down meat into what are the different components of meat. So there are multiple different things. We could have unprocessed meat. We could have processed meat. We could have red meat. We could have white meat. We could have fish, depending on whether or not you think that's meat. In order to study this, you got to understand there are different variables that we need to look at. Are we looking at momentary changes that extrapolate to lifelong health? In other words, does it just increase LDL cholesterol and does increasing LDL cholesterol then mean increased cardiovascular mortality? I think what we really need to know, what we really want to know is does meat associate it with all cause mortality? Does it associate with cancer? Does it associate with cardiac mortality, which is our leading cause of death? And are those associations good associations? In other words, is the research very strong for those? It was just a huge uh, meta-analysis was done a couple days ago. Sotomo, uh, David Ludwig, Adrian Sotomoto uh, was the primary. And they found that, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in a specific population. These are people that are on low-carb diets that aren't eating processed foods, uh, that are eating a lot of meat. And in that particular type of population, we see that the biggest driver for LDL increases are, in fact, being lean. And, and it, Garth is a weight loss surgeon. He knows the value of being lean that generally reduces your risk for diabetes, heart disease, cancer, you know, pretty much every chronic disease gets better when we get leaner. And so in that particular population, we see for some reason LDL goes up and, and being lean seems to predict that. So that's unusual to say the least. It's, it's, it wouldn't be what you expect. In fact, in that low carb population, they found that being obese actually caused that the LDL cholesterol go down. So then you start to say, well, is it better for me to be obese than lean? And I don't think it is. Um, when we talk about saturated fat, remember saturated fat is, it's not just one thing. You know, saturated fat, is it myristic acid, lauric acid, caproic acid, caprylic acid? Is it steric, oleic, you know, on and on and on. So we can talk about what are these different saturated fats and how do they independently affect us? And we also have to realize that in the United States, where does saturated fat come from? If we look at a Western diet, and interestingly, the majority of sat well, the, some of the biggest drivers of saturated fat consumption are sandwiches, uh, dessert products, cakes, you know, things like that. Cakes have, you know, eggs and butter, and sometimes dairy products. And really only 4% of our saturated fat consumption comes from whole unprocessed meat, a steak or something like that, or a piece of chicken or fish. And so we have all these sort of dietary confounders that plague all of these epidemiologic studies, you know. Uh, the recent study from Harvard that showed that uh, red meat increased risk for uh, diabetes by 62%. Lasagna was defined as red meat. Sandwiches are just defined as red meat. And so I would contend that we're not answering the question that, at least not to the, to the interest of the population that, that I am promoting. And so I'm not, I'm saying, what happens when you don't eat, sat you, when you don't eat uh, processed food and you're just eating a whole food meat-based diet? If I were to say that to Garth that, hey, a vegan diet is Oreo cookies, Coca-Cola, vegan cheese, and a couple pieces of fruit and vegetables. He, of course, would push back on that. And I think this is the same sort of scenario here. And we don't have, we don't really have a lot of studies on people eating in, in the fashion I'm describing. Mostly meat-based with very little to no processed, you know, ultra-processed garbage, which I think is really the problem that we're talking about. There's, there's, you know, very few studies that have that that would meet the criteria of long-term uh, hard clinical endpoints, not just, you know, we've got some biomarker that we we suspect may be associated with this stuff. And so, again, I would say, I don't know. I, I, I will say, I don't know if, if my diet is going to make somebody live longer. I don't know if it's going to 
either prevent or increase the likelihood of some disease because we just don't have the data that shows that now. What I can say is in the short term, which I do think is valuable, by the way, I think when you have a patient that's in front of you that's sick and suffering, if you have an option to make them no longer sick and suffering, that's kind of what you're supposed to be doing as a physician. Now, the long-term stuff, I think, is at best speculative. Even though we have literally spent billions of dollars on epidemiologic studies, Adventist Health, all the stuff coming out of Harvard, Epic, Epic Oxford, all those studies which are, you know, Nurses Health, on and on. We've spent lots of money on those studies. I don't think they've really shown us that much definitively. I mean, speculative at best. And again, it doesn't describe the population that I am concerned with. <laughs> you know, you see some of the social media goofy side of me. You don't see what I'm telling people day to day when I talk to people. And when I tell people, we don't know yet. And so I would be cautious. If your LDL is high, consider lowering it. If you don't want to do that for very, maybe you don't want to go on the drugs, maybe you don't want to change your diet, then at the very least, serially image what's going on until we have more data. And I think that is a reasonable approach. I'm not some, I don't, I don't want to have heart disease. That's what I do for myself. I had a CAC score when I was 51, it was zero. I'm going to get another one probably this year. Hopefully it'll still be zero. If it's not, I may change things. I'm not, I'm not married to this. This isn't an ideology for me. And like you, I don't tell people, you know, you don't tell everybody to go vegan. You tell them, hey, you know, reduce your garbage. I'm sure you're telling everybody to reduce the garbage and the sugar and all the added oils and things like that. Eat a healthy plant-based diet. If you want to include some lean chicken breasts in there, go for it. Likewise, I tell people, try carnivore. You may want to add some fruits, some vegetables, things like that if it works for you. And I think that's Again, we just disagree on how much meat's in there, right? I think that's the main disagreement here. The reason I eat mostly meat now, I never used to ever. Like I used to, I, I actually used to have an eating disorder when I was younger. So I didn't eat much of a lot of things, honestly. But I, when I started to eat more meat, I felt full. I've looked better. I had more energy. I was, you know, I just, I don't know how to explain it. I was all around better um, in every way. And so that's what got me going into, um, getting more interested in this lifestyle. And then I started learning about it and understanding it. And then I started seeing that other people were feeling better. And anyways, I, I cured my, an eating disorder with this lifestyle and I tried everything prior to that. Now, granted, I was having a lot of processed foods too. So I, I hadn't removed those before going to this carnivore lifestyle. But my question is, you know, why isn't there more interest from the plant-based community in this carnivore lifestyle or an animal-based lifestyle? If it's working for people and if it's helping them, I mean, a lot of people are plant-based, not for their health, right? So those people are not going to be curious no matter what you show. Uh, this is an ethical decision for them, and that's not an interest. The other thing is you can't throw away data. I mean, we've got a lot of studies. I mean, I've got a whole table here if you want me to start going through studies that associate meat with heart disease especially, of all things. Now, unprocessed meat does a lot better than processed meat. So we could get, uh, Sean brought this up earlier, and it's gonna be true on a plant-based diet too. There's a healthy meat, healthier meat, and there's a healthier plant-based diet. But there is a clear, in, in multiple, multiple, multiple studies, showing long-term consumption of meat is associated with our number one killer, heart disease. And this is in multiple different cohorts in multiple different parts of the world whether you're looking at Epic, whether you're looking at Venice, whether you're looking at uh, uh, Shanghai, whether you're looking, I mean, there's so many different studies. I've got books and, and things on it. So there's definitely a correlation. I don't think you could throw that away. And I don't, I think feeling better is not necessarily the answer. So you could feel better and yet still be sick. I mean, there've been some, some, you know, we, and we've seen it both plant and animal side, but we've seen some very famous people charged Charles Poliquin, people like this that are like big, muscular, six-pack abs, drop mm -hmm. dead of heart disease, all right? Um, and, and so I don't know that you could necessarily say, I feel better means I am better. You could feel better just because you're not eating as much junk food. You take anybody on a standard American diet, I don't care what you do. You put them on a meat-based diet, you could put them on a vegan diet, they're going to feel... Sure. Well, I mean, I think it's cool. dangerous to use Charles Poliquin or what was the guy, Bob, the biggest loser guy. I mean, because, I mean, for every one of those headline-grabbing, yeah. anomalous, lean guys that has a heart attack, there's... 5,000 couch potatoes with a big belly. I mean, the cath labs are not lined up with lean guys with abs getting stents. I mean, yeah. we know it's all 
what we're seeing there. So, I, so sure. I mean, it's just like I could say somebody smoked it's and lived a hundred. I mean, great. Yeah. There's people that do that. So, to me, that's not. I mean, I, I think generally people that are generally healthy are generally healthy, and they feel good, they look good, they perform well. Uh, they don't have aches and pains. They're not depressed. I think that is a general sign of health. I think there's more support for plant-based in general. I think people think we're going to save the planet. We're going to save some cows. And I think that's there's some bias in that. You, you know, even in the in the dietary guidelines, they're starting to let that creep in. What's better for the – what do we think is better for the environment? And I think that's unfortunate because I think nutrition should be nutrition, and there should not be some ethical bias to that, which I think I think, unfortunately, there is in many cases. If somebody wants to go on a better diet, I'm good. Whatever works for you at the end of the day, I'm, I'm happy to see people get healthy. I'm, it's, my, it's not my mission to eat as many cows as possible. I'd like to see people be healthy because we have a sick society, mental health as well, and, and nutrition clearly impacts that as well. And so when we have a sick society, it's just not fun. It's not, it's not, it's not fun to go to a grocery store and see everybody's sick. I don't, I don't like to see that. I'm sure Garth feels the same way. Yeah, yeah Garth, how do you feel about that? All that? I see. <laughs> I mean, every day I get food logs, right? Thousands and thousands of food logs. And you can't believe what people are eating on a daily basis. It, 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 I read it and I'm grossed out. I have to like stop and be like, don't be judgmental. They're not where you're coming from. But it's hard because you see what they're eating. And you're just like, I, where do I even begin with this person? Like we're having this nice little intricacies about what is the long-term study of sex. And I'm looking at a person who is eating ice cream, potato chips, uh, cheeseburger with fries and a chocolate shake. It, it's a totally different scenario. And so I'm starting at a totally different standpoint with my patients. What are key processes? Look, I, and we didn't even get into this. We didn't even get into like the theory on my book was that the, we, th I think we speak too much about protein. I don't think we speak enough about fiber. We didn't really get into fiber. Uh, I think people are fiber deficient. We're getting too much protein, not enough fiber. And that drives people to make bad food choices where they choose bacon because they think they need protein or they avoid an apple because they think it has sugar in it. In fact, fruit and vegetables, the things I really want people eating, it gets maybe 4% of that funding. 30% of the funding goes to the food that then goes to feed the animals. Uh, and again, it's the food that goes to feed the animals that I don't think is the animals you want to eat, Sean. Uh, these are the grain-fed animals. Um, and so they're eating the cheap grains, the soys, the things like that. And so most of it, like Sean was alluding to, go, the Farm Bill is trying to fund the dairy producers but also the feed producers that feed mm -hmm. the dairy cows and so most of the food most of the funding doesn't go anywhere near the unprocessed right. foods 1950 1954 we peaked in our smoking i think 45 percent of the population was smokers it's now down to 14 percent. so we can do this i mean we have the mechanism in place either through government with corporate cooperation to make these type of sweeping dramatic population health changes and lifestyle changes because we've been successful at smoking. So there's no reason we can't do it. It's just that obviously there's a lot of money involved. And, and when 95% of the people sitting on the U.S. dietary guidelines have industry funding ties, that's a real problem. I don't think the idea is that you're going to die without fiber, but you're, you, you need fiber to be healthy. So without fiber, you are unhealthy. With fiber, you are healthy. That's when I was growing up, that was my mom's belief. That was what I ate. You have a high fiber cereal, you know, high fiber diet, whatever. That's going to make you have more bowel movements. That's going to make you be healthier long-term and short-term. So um, I think overall in the carnivore animal-based uh, space, they kind of say that fiber from plants is not necessary um, from what a lot of people I've heard now. I'm curious though, what you guys both think. So Sean, if you want to kind of enlighten, like share more about what the space believes sure. on that. Well, I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody. I can, I can speak to what I believe. I mean, I mean, clearly fiber is not essential for life or I would have passed away long, long, long ago. So it's clearly not essential in the terms that I would describe essential, like, you know, protein is essential. If you don't have no protein, you die. Right. Um, but it's conditionally beneficial. I don't discount that at all. I think that fiber, often fiber consumption is a marker of diet quality, as, as uh, Garth alluded to, this plant-based dietary index. And so if you're eating more fruits and vegetables, you're probably not eating as many cakes and cookies. And I think that's probably where a lot of the benefit is coming from, just what it is replacing. 
Um, does it have some, you know, you know, individual, you know, does it provide some sense of satiety? Probably so for some people. Does it uh, limit glucose excursions, you know, an apple versus apple juice? Yes, probably so. So I think there's, there's certainly conditional reasons why fiber, you know, if you're eating a mixed omnivorous diet, I think you should probably eat a little more fiber than, than, than obviously junk food. What about my population? Again, I'm interested in a very su- specific subset of people. And what, what I see, and there are, there, there's a few studies out there showing, I mean, one, you know, study by Tommy Wood, and I, I think maybe I added there, Tommy Wood and, and uh, Lucy Mailer, um, metabolic flexibility of the gut, because we hear so much about fiber and its ability to produce short chain fatty acids, particularly things like butyrate. Well, it turns out that protein can do it, that, you know, being in a low carb state, you have butyrate floating around anyway, and it's, it provides a similar benefit. So I think some of those things are, you don't need fiber for those things necessarily. Um, I think that uh, fiber has been shown to lower cholesterol. And again, this is, you know, obviously Garth and I d- disagree somewhat on the, on the value of doing that, but I mean, it, there, there are certain clear benefits to having fiber in the diet. Is it necessary? Does it apply equally to all populations? I would say, I don't think that it does, or I, I'm, I'm inclined to believe that it doesn't. I see people that again, I mean, I'm, I'm interested. I'm not so much interested in healthy people. I'm interested in sick people. And when I get somebody that's got uh, RA or Crohn's disease, there was a study that came out. I, I don't know. That's one on Prevotella. I mean, I, I, there's one on high fiber diet. It's yeah. Yeah. High fiber diet exacerbates uh, Prevotella copra. I'm one of the species of, you know, it's, it's a weird microbiome. The microbiome stuff is so in its infancy, we don't really know what it does, but there is some indications in some people that more fiber actually makes conditions worse. And so when I see those people and they reduce the fiber or even sometimes to none, they get better. One, it tells me, well, it's not necessary. And two, it is conditionally beneficial to lower that. But I think in the general omnivorous population that maybe Garth is going to talk about, fiber has clearly been shown to be beneficial. I don't doubt that. But I think, again, I think there are, again, when we're comparing apples to oranges and we've only studied apples and we've got very little data on the oranges, again, I will concede there is not a lot of studies on carnivore and these types of diets. That's why I wanted to get them done because, you know, I see a signal clinically every day that there are some benefits to maybe reducing fiber in some cases. Fiber, I think, may be the most important. But I mean, it's kind of they, funny, you know, Garth, funny you say because we can't even really, as digest I it. Man. I mean, it's like it's the most important food that we can't even digest, right? <laughs> but see, that's the point. So that's what I was getting to. We can't digest because maybe our most important organ is our microbiome. Uh, I, I'm starting to really fall for the microbiome. Now, we're in our infancy stages of microbiome. We've got an expert at Methodist that I'm working with to, to do some more studies on this. Probably the world's expert on this is Andrew Reynolds and the World Health Population, the World Health Organization asked Reynolds to do a series of men analysis and systematic reviews on fiber and diet. And he did several, one looking at uh, colon cancer, one looking at diabetes, uh, one looking at overall health. You could look up Andrew Reynolds and the World Health Organization series and systematic reviews. Uh, with looking at carbohydrate quality. About 80,000 years ago, they, they they think that we started converting more towards a plant-based diet, which, you know, arguably is enough time to adapt. You know, big, you know obviously at some point we were primates in the trees eating, eating lots of fruit and then we, whatever, climate change led to the drying of the environment and hominids had to have different strategies and there were you know, Australopithecus boisei and robustus that tried to go vegan and they went extinct and homo sapiens ultimately homo sapiens sapien which we are ultimately survived and so it's interesting you know i i I don't have a time machine um but i mean there's decent evidence that we so there there are two species called paranthropus boisei or paranthropus robustus there's two of them they sometimes go by australopithecus uh boisei robustus and you look at one was called the Nutcracker Man, yeah. and they had a really strong, powerful jaws designed to chew through like twigs and whatever to yeah. get their nutrition. And they just went extinct because it's a, the, the environment would not support that sort of lifestyle long enough. It just, I guess it just got too cold and dry eventually. So they went extinct and guys that learned how to hunt kind of survived. So interesting. 
Yeah, it's interesting because there's a lot of people that have different views, right? They say there's the Australopithecus, but at the same time, there's Homo erectus. So, like that, we weren't like one. After well, we, the other. we we yeah, they inter groups. they 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 mingled back time, and forth and inter. Totally inter yeah, we've got we've all got some Neanderthal DNA. Right, we've got some some of have, DNA. Yeah, you got zero. I have zero. I got mine checked. Yeah. I got zero Neanderthal. Oh, really? I, I have probably have. I never had checked mine. I'm probably like fifty percent Neanderthal. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>